Uh, so John Morello, CTO of Twistlock, um, super happy to have you. Where I didn't catch where you were sitting today, so um, in New Orleans, New Orleans, another place. So we went from Paris to LA to New Orleans, uh, another place I would love to be because I've uh, I've been to the city so many times. Uh, great experiences there. Um, John, as I mentioned to you in Slack, I think a AB and Amro. Uh, Fannie Mae, Aetna, uh, and, and perhaps others as well. It seems like Twistlock's logo is on every slide of every DevSecOps reference architecture out there, along with our Nexus products and, and uh, Fortify and others out there in the community. Um, so I, I know a lot of people out there are definitely interested in hearing you know, what's going on at Twistlock, how you're working with, uh, with your customers out there that are also working with Nexus. Um, so without further ado, I want to just uh, hand over to you. We'll get your slides up and running so we can make sure that we can see them shared uh, and go from there. All right, very good. Well, I, I appreciate the uh, the intro uh, and I'll go ahead and get, get right to the slides. Uh, so let me get them shared out. Okay, I can see your slides. Great. And are you able to see the full yep. full screen presentation now? Yep, got it. All right, very good. So uh, again, I'm John Morello. I'm the CTO for Twistlock. Uh, a little bit of background on us, if you don't know us. Uh, we've been around for uh, about, actually a little bit more than three years now. We were kind of the first company that uh, had a container security solution. Uh, since then, we've really broadened our focus to, to really try to provide a security platform for cloud native computing in general. Uh, and, and what I mean by cloud native is all those things that are part of the cloud native computing foundation. So not just you know Docker and containers, but also OpenShift and Kubernetes and uh, serverless functions, and as well as the virtual machines that we typically see people using as part of the overall application topology for even their containerized applications. Uh, what we see out there in the real world is less a uh, kind of a religious approach to saying everything is in containers to, to really being a, a more pragmatic approach and realizing that containers are great for a lot of capabilities. Serverless is great for some things. You still probably have some, uh, I don't even say legacy apps, but some workloads that for whatever reason you prefer to run on a VM. And so we give you as a, as a customer a full lifecycle set of capabilities um, that spans that entire environment. Um, obviously talking here at, at the uh, uh, at this Nexus conference, I want to talk more specifically about what we do uh, around the DevOps and CI CD integration, the place where, where people use uh, Twistlock and Nexus very frequently together uh, to be able to secure that entire pipeline. Um, but that's just one part of what we do, and, and um, I just want to make sure everybody understands the, the full scope of, of what's out there. So let's, uh, let's get into and talk about really what's different about securing containers. Um, obviously, containers are a different kind of mechanism for packaging and running applications. Um, that's probably very obvious on the surface. However, it the kind of the underlying challenges and, and um, not just challenges, but actually opportunities for securing containers are not always as obvious to people. So when you think about uh, uh, building a container security solution, not just one for the CI CD part of the world, but also um, you know providing runtime defense and firewalling and all those things that are there, there are both advantages and disadvantages uh, to containers, I guess, or let's say cloud native in general. Um, and when I say advantages, I mean things that allow you to do security more effectively and more easily, and disadvantages for things that, that make those uh, that, that make security potentially more challenging. So over the next couple of slides, I'm gonna explain what those advantages and disadvantages are, and then we'll talk about how we leverage the advantages to, to give you really a better, uh, more secure CI CD platform by integrating containers as part of that work, workflow. So containers have three characteristics um, that really make uh, security or give you at least the potential to do security in a different way than you've been able to do in the old world. Um, containers are minimal. You know, instead of creating a virtual machine that's got you know full-blown OS and data and libraries and the application code and so forth, which is really difficult to deterministically understand everything that's inside of that 
you know, VMDK or our virtual machine uh, uh, Omni that you that you have on AWS, for example, um, a container is much more minimalistic, right? The container includes your application components and you know the dependencies it has in terms of frameworks, but it doesn't include a full OS. It doesn't include data. It's a much smaller amount of, of bits, basically, that you have to deal with. You know, if you think about a traditional uh, virtual hard drive, you know, it's probably you know at least five, ten gigs, maybe. Um, if you think about a container, most containers that, that we see in the real world are uh, tens, hundreds of megs. Um, so literally an order of magnitude smaller. And the reason why that size is so important is it, is it effectively allows software like Twistlock to be able to really completely and precisely understand all the components that are inside of those images in a much more reliable way than you can do with a full virtual machine. Containers are also very declarative. So a container is built from an image. An image is uh, composed of layers. Layers are described in a Docker file. So in addition to being less stuff to deal with, that stuff is also by default better documented. You know, you could create you know, some kind of text format or something that would describe the way that you built a virtual hard drive, but that's an optional process. And, and you know, of course, it's not gonna be something that you can rely on being present, um, you know, in every uh, environment you might go into. Whereas with containers, the only way to build a container is from an image. The only way to build an image is, is from this manifest. Uh, and so that allows, again, software like Twistlock to be able to go in there and really uh, co comprehensively understand what's inside of that image. We don't have to guess at it. We don't have to try to you know, apply a whole bunch of different heuristics that, you know, that may have some fuzzy accuracy to them. We can be really complete and clear on what components are inside of a given image. And then finally, and this is more something that, that, that's really beneficial at runtime, um, but, but has ramifications upstream in that CI process is that containers at least should be operated in a much more predictable fashion. Of course, you can, uh, like with any tool, use it for good or for evil. And certainly there's, there's some people out there that we've seen operate containers more like virtual machines and SSH into them and apt update and so forth. But that's certainly not the recommended or, or even the natural approach to use with it. That natural approach is to have something that's much more predictable. Uh, I deploy my container. That container has uh, a, uh, an image inside of it. When I want to update that image, I want to rev my software or update a dependency that it has, I destroy that container, reprovision a new one with a new version of that image that includes the new versions of the components. And so that allows you from a runtime standpoint to really understand what that image should be doing at runtime and then look for anomalies relative to what is predicted to be able to identify those problems and prevent them without a whole bunch of manual rules having to be created to do so. So those characteristics, the minimalistic, declarative, and predictable nature of containers, those are the advantages. Those are the things that it enables from a security standpoint, enables you to do security more efficiently, more scalable with less human operator involvement. The challenges that you have with containers though um, are, are also present. And these aren't, these aren't necessarily flaws with containers, it's just, just different challenges because the technology itself is different. With containers, you typically are dealing with a lot more entities. If I had a application that I built, um, you know, even a multi-tiered app that I was running just on classical VMs, like let's say a, a you know, typical kind of three-tiered app, even if I wanna do that in an HA manner, um, I might just have a couple of VMs as the front end, a couple of VMs at the app tier, and then some kind of cluster database on the back end. If I want to really do that properly with containers, I have to decompose that into microservices. And instead of having effectively three different uh, tiers and, and really just having replicas of each one of those tiers, I might end up having uh, dozens, literally, of microservices there. I might have one microservice that's just for the initial logon page, a different microservice that enumerates uh, products in this application, a different one for the shopping cart, a different one for uh, managing uh, your, your user profile, for example. The whole goal of doing things like this with microservices is to, to decompose that app and to make the individual components easier to build, to iterate, to scale, but that also means that there's a lot more things that you have to deal with and to secure. Furthermore, those things change a lot more frequently. Again, one of the benefits of this whole architectural model is 
I don't have to look at those tiers as monoliths. I don't have to say like, you know, because I need to make this small change to the way the shopping cart works, I have to redeploy this entire application that includes not just the shopping cart, but the user logon page, the user profile service, because all that's just kind of bundled up into one application. I can now make that change specifically to one of the microservices without changing the others, but that also means that the churn through the environment is a lot more frequent than what you may have been used to in the past. The third one is probably the most relevant one for the purposes of this talk today, which is that security becomes much more in the hands of the developer than it ever has been before. Um, in the past, you could, as a developer, build your application. Um, hopefully, you're using a tool like Nexus and scanning and understanding vulnerabilities and preventing those vulnerabilities before they're ever deployed, but not everybody uses tools like Nexus, of course. Uh, and then you would hand that application to the operator and the operator would deploy. And then you would usually would have some kind of tooling, um, something like a Qualys or Tenable or something like that, that they would then use over time to look for vulnerabilities in that image or any, excuse me, in that application. Uh, and then when they found those vulnerabilities, oftentimes it would be the operator's job to say, hey, this VM that's running um, this application, it needs an update to the JDK or, or some other library that you're using. And the operator would be responsible for updating the actual application after it had been deployed. The developer would really just kind of worry about their own functional code and, and the rest of it was uh, up to the operations team to manage over time. One of the most fundamental differences with containers is because you are taking that entire application and shipping it as a kind of an immutable image, this, this thing that's not going to be changed once it's handed from developer to or into production, um, the developer now becomes responsible for updating that entire stack within their application. And that's a big change for a lot of organizations because the same tooling that you've been using before in many cases will not be container aware, won't even be able to tell you where you have problems. And even if it does, it's not gonna be able to help you address those problems unless it has integration upstream in that CI process. And the integration that Twistlock that we have, that we built with, uh, with Sonatype within Nexus is a really good example of how that works. I'll show you guys some screenshots of that later, but basically the idea is every time you build your application, you are getting inside of that same build process data about the vulnerabilities that exist, the compliance posture of the image, your security team can set policies that say like, if this image includes vulnerabilities above a certain threshold, like you know high or critical, actually fail the build and force the developer to fix it before it ever leaves their environment. But this change, this responsibility for vulnerability management and compliance and configuration management being something that really only the developer can do effectively is the, probably the biggest shift from a security standpoint as organizations move from more classical uh, application uh, management methodologies to something that's more oriented towards containers and, and microservices. So as I mentioned at Twistlock, we, we have a platform that does a lot of different things. Um, it, the, the CI CD part is what we're really gonna focus on mostly uh, you know, during this talk, obviously. But there's other things that, that we do that span that life cycle. So Docker has this notion they often talk about of build, ship, and run. Uh, and for those of you guys that are using Sonatype, you know, or Sonatype products, you're, you know, you're probably more on the left-hand side of this. But but as these phases kind of have blended together with this whole notion of DevOps and continuous deployment and so forth, uh, a lot of people that may have historically thought of themselves really just as a as a developer um, are now being exposed to a lot more sort of operational aspects of the environment. So in addition to the vulnerability management and compliance pieces that are directly applicable upstream and in, in, in the entirety of the CI CD flow, you may also have a need for things like uh, firewalling and micro segmentation of the applications after they've been deployed, uh, runtime defense, which is basically an active threat protection capability to look for anomalies uh, within the application, again, based on that model that we can create because of the declarative and minimal nature of those images in the first place. Um, and then access control, which is always an important thing for an enterprise. This is not about access control for your apps, but access control for the management plane. Um, at Twistlock, we actually built the authorization framework that's in Docker itself. Red Hat uses that same thing in OpenShift. We also built the secrets management framework that's in Docker. So even if you're not a Twistlock customer today, if you're using containers and you're doing something around access control, uh, you're actually using software that, that we built and, and contributed to the open source. 
So um, this slide is probably not terribly shocking, honestly, um, you know, for, for you guys that are actually in this day to day and, and doing this as, as your profession, you, you probably have seen, hopefully not in your current job, but probably in some previous job that you were smart enough to leave that uh, a lot of organizations um, really don't have security to, uh, integrated very much at all in the development process. Uh, you know, certainly that's not a, a universal truth. We talk to a lot and have a lot of customers that, that really uh, are very passionate about that and understand and see the value of, of, again, shifting that security left and pushing it further upstream. However, um, uh, you know, even from what we see, that that's more the exception than the rule. And in a lot of cases, development teams would be uh, just as happy to not have any kind of uh, security controls or requirements in place and, you know, kind of be left alone to, to uh, develop and to ship their application however they would like to. But, um, you know, as I mentioned a, a few moments ago, as you adopt this cloud native approach to building and, and running your applications, it is unavoidable. The only way that you can really secure those apps is to move more security knowledge, responsibility, and enforcement upstream in that life cycle versus dealing with it retroactively after the problem has already been deployed in production. So um, as you think about this and, and this 20% this that are doing the right thing, it really is, 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 is uh, you know, illustrating the fact that 80% of those customers, 80% of organizations um, really have some, have some shifting to do. And this is not really a, as much of a technical shift. You know, again, tools like, uh, like Nexus and Twistlock and so forth that you can use to help do that have been around for years now. It's really more of a people and process shift to understand that there is a change to the way that you have to build the software, the responsibilities of the different teams involved, and then to adopt that notion and those changes into your day-to-day -day operations. So what, are the, what do those changes actually look like? You know, what does it mean for you as a developer when you think about vulnerability management and compliance and so forth uh, in your day-to-day -day job? So there, there's some key differences between the, the old world and the new world for vulnerability management. Um, you know, as I alluded to earlier, the traditional model, the vulnerability management was often done as a post-deployment job. You know, somebody built their application, you know, and even in a, in a high functioning sort of uh, development environment, they build their app and they would run some kind of security scanning tool on it afterwards and then go back and, you know, remediate vulnerabilities. In a lot of cases that didn't happen and only after the app was deployed would the operations team use some kind of scanner and find vulnerabilities and then somebody would have to go back and remediate those problems. However, even in a case like that where it was a fairly high functioning team, you didn't have the ability to say that every time that you build and every time that you deploy, that deployment job or that build job has to meet this minimum threshold to be allowed to complete. And that's one of the things that the modern world allows you to do. So you can have that vulnerability scanning integrated into Jenkins or Circle CI or Team City or whatever tool you want. Um, you know, we have native plugins for, for all of them. And obviously we, we are able to share that data with Nexus through the integration that we have. And that really allows you to have that scanning and that experience in a, in a much more natural way for a developer. Um, you know, as, as you guys probably are all familiar with in, in your personal lives, if, if you have to build something and then step out of your normal build environment uh, and dev environment into a completely different tool to scan it and then you get results in a different format and you have to go back and figure out how to reconcile that, it really adds a lot of friction and friction ends up, you know, frustrating people and getting them just to, to, to kind of ignore it. Uh, and so we've really prioritized this notion of making it a integrated, natural part of the experience such that every time you do a build job, you get that vulnerability data back in the same UI that you're already using for, for building your application. It's provided to you in a really rich format. So you don't just get something that says like, hey, package foo version three has a vulnerability. We give you all the rich data about it. You know, it's this version, here's the description, here's a CVSS score. Is it remotely exploitable or not? Does an exploit exist in the wild or not? Is the vendor fix available yet or not? So you can be very smart about what do you focus on? Because one of the challenges that you often find with this is, you know, even in a fairly small environment, you might have, you know, hundreds of images, thousands of total vulnerabilities, if you don't have the intelligence built in to help you focus on the things that really matter, you get lost in the noise and, and are really never going to be able to address those things that are most important. Uh, and so providing that visibility, that integrated awareness is really key. Automated and, and policy driven blocking of builds and deployments is another key aspect of this, which is to say, 
in addition to being able to integrate into that dev process and show the developers, here are the problems, here are the vulnerabilities, to actually be able to set in place a process and a, a flow there that says, if the vulnerabilities exceed what's allowed by policy, actually prevent this build from, from succeeding, You know, actually fail it, force the developer to fix it right then and there when it's the lowest cost, the least amount of effort before it ever exposes you to risk in production. At the same time though, we also have capabilities that say every time that that image or any image is run in production, we're gonna assess the vulnerability posture of that image at that specific point in time and only allow things that pass policy then to be deployed. So if you build your image today, maybe it's totally fine. Over the weekend, there's some critical CVE that comes out. On Monday, you don't wanna deploy that image into your production internet facing cluster if it's got a remote code exploit for something that's in critical nature in your application. And because we're providing kind of that dual step process, not just at build time, but also at deploy time, you have multiple layers of defense and depth there to make sure that you're only deploying things that meet the posture that you've specified um, for your environment. And of course, that's completely granular and configurable. So you may have different rules for dev and test and prod and the US versus Europe and so forth. But the end goal with all this is to allow you to express that policy one time and then to have the security platform enforce that all the way upstream and all the way downstream. Compliance is kind of the next area that we talk about. When I say compliance, what I'm really specifically talking about is kind of the security configuration of your application. So think about you know, best practices like not running stuff as root, not embedding private keys in your image, um, not having SSH embedded within your image. Uh, we contributed to the Docker and the Kubernetes CIS benchmarks. We actually wrote the NIST special publication, or I should say we're one of the primary authors of uh, NIST SP80190, which is the container security guide. So we've been really involved in trying to help the industry overall set policy and best practices around secure configuration for containers. And so what we've done in our product is we've taken all those several hundred checks and put them in as just pre-built uh, uh, individual checks that you can build your own template for enforcing. You can also use pre-built templates we have for things like PCI, HIPAA, and GDPR, um, where we've gone and pre-selected which of those individual checks makes sense to support one of those standards. And again, the traditional approach to doing this would be, you know, if your dev team was even aware of these things in the first place, they would have to manually check that as part of the build process. There's very few tools that really do that in a generic way because, again, without containers, you don't have a consistent packaging uh, and, and image format such that you can have software that really looks at, at all the different kind of, of application frameworks and artifacts you might create to find these, these uh, best practices. And so then what, what often would happen was you would build your application development with certain expectations. You know, it ran maybe as root or uh, whatever settings you had in development you'd hand that app over to the guys that were gonna run in production and suddenly the app would quote unquote break, right? Because it required to run as root or it required that it was gonna have like this private key at a particular path or whatever it may be that was different between development and production. And one of the things that we can do now with having this consistent format of a container image is we can again apply those same compliance checks upstream in the development process such that every time you're doing a build, we're going to enforce that that build is compliant with whatever policies you have in place in production. So it's a full fidelity of configuration settings between the build that you have in your dev environment, what you test and what you actually deploy. So there's no ambiguity or confusion about what the settings should be. And again, you have that multi-level uh, enforcement at the CI process at build time, in production and deployment time to only allow those things that are compliant with your policies to actually be deployed. Um, and then because you've got this, this pipeline that everything has to go through, we can also provide this, this really rich dashboard, something we call Compliance Explorer, that shows you all the checks specific to your environment that you've enabled. It shows you the real-time status of all of them. You know, you're 80% compliant or 40% compliant or whatever with this check, what the outliers are. So that instead of you guys having to do uh, compliance the old way, which was you know, you gave some auditor a couple of sample systems and they ran some tools and they put it in Excel and the whole thing was super painful and took like three weeks. Um, now it's just part of the build job and you can automate it. It's all software. It's something you can see that you can understand and that you can enforce again through a centralized policy. 
One of the things that we focus on uh, in the product as well, and, and really our whole relationship with, with Sonatype has been about having a really great developer experience. And so one of the things that we've tried to do is to ensure that as you build your images as a developer, you get really useful, clear information to be able to understand where vulnerabilities and compliance defects exist within that image. Because what we see, especially within large organizations, is oftentimes images are built by multiple teams or multiple individuals on a team, right? You might have two or three developers that work on the same thing and each kind of work in their own piece of, of the application. And so one of the things that we do, and you can see on this screenshot here is, um, we actually take the, the image itself and for every image, we show you the vulnerabilities that are associated on a layer by layer basis. So as you scroll through the layers on the left hand side, the actual Docker file that composes that image in that right hand pane is constantly being updated and the line that you're on will be highlighted. You can see what layers have added what vulnerabilities. So when there are CVEs that are detected in a given image, you can go to exactly the right layer in the image to be able to fix it and know exactly what developer needs to do so. All of the image results that we have are all correlated around the image ID, the, the, the digest value, the SHA of the image itself, which means that it, it gives you a really powerful way to tie together that, that immutable uh, nature of container images from development to production. So when you're doing those scans in the very beginning of your development process, and you can see that you know an image with the SHA value of, of one, two, three has these versions of these components and these CVEs, that data doesn't just exist inside of your build job. It's shared with our central console, which is kind of environment-wide, which protects your, your upstream work as well as your, your downstream production environments. And as soon as that image is introduced anywhere else in the environment, be it in another build job, be it in uh, production, we don't have to go and scan that image again to know what its posture is because we already know the posture of that image as uniquely identified by its SHA and anything that would have changed any aspect of that image will invalidate the SHA. And thus we have this model that allows us to basically say, no matter where this image is seen over time, we definitively know all the components, all the versions, and then can then detect vulnerabilities across that environment without having to scan the images again. Because in our console database, we know that, again, this image includes these packages with these versions. So when a vulnerability comes out and we ingest that through our intelligence stream and then your, your console that you run in your environment pulls that data down from our intelligence stream, you can instantly identify all the full scope of vulnerabilities across your entire environment. And one of the places where that's really cool and useful is this capability that, uh, that we have called the risk tree, which helps you analyze the exposure that you have to vulnerabilities across your environment. So instead of you having to, as, as again, you had to do in the old world, to really kind of say, you know, if this new CVE, like for Heartbleed, for example, comes out, you know, I have to go kind of manually figure out what components are, are vulnerable. I have to then go and look at like what VMs are running those components. And, you know, it's a lot of work and a lot of kind of Excel drudgery where you're putting data from multiple systems and trying to munge it together. Again, the nature of containers enables a tool like Twistlock to say, we know that this CVE impacts this version or these versions of this component. We know this component exists in these images, that these images run in these containers, that these containers run on these hosts, and that these hosts exist in these clouds. And this risk tree that we have is literally an API, as, as is everything else in our product. Uh, it's literally an API and, and, a, and a UI where you just say like, here's a set of CVEs, show me, basically build out this hierarchical view of all the places that I'm exposed. And then you can instantly understand what images need to be updated and go back upstream in that development process, fix those images, redeploy them, and take a huge amount of effort out of that you know, detection, understanding, remediation uh, work stream that you're constantly having to cycle through as new CVEs come out. So this is a really clear example of how those characteristics of containers really enable a better security posture over time. 
you know, as I mentioned, we, we, we've done a lot of work literally for, for years now for integration with, uh, with uh, Nexus IQ. Um, certainly, we'd be happy to talk with, with anybody that wants to know more about how we integrate with, with upstream tools like Nexus. And you can see that, that commonality of data between the really far upstream artifacts that Twistlock, Twistlock is not looking into at all. The, you know, the things that might exist like just in a file share, a jar file that, that sits on some server someplace to the images that we do look at as part of the build process and then how you can see that, that data together with Twistlock and Nexus. And then the things that we do downstream that are unique in our product, like being able to scan images, exist in your registry and all the runtime and preventative things that we can do post registry at production at deployment time. So it's really a better together story where when you have a tool like Nexus and Twistlock together, you really get full spectrum vulnerability from the very earliest phases of the build process all the way through production runtime across any cloud, wherever you're running those applications. So just to close, um, you know, I mentioned we have a lot of other capabilities in the platform around active threat protection. Um, I'm not going to go into these in a lot of detail. Certainly, we'd be happy to talk with anybody and show them to you. Um, if you want to visit us at twistlock.com, you can see some details for that. Uh, we have a really neat tool that we call Runtime Radar. And it gives you this basically live visio of all of your microservices and how they talk to each other. And we overlay all that information with uh, vulnerability and compliance posture for your images. So it really, again, ties together that notion of what you've deployed with what we know about upstream as, as part of that CI CD process. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and wrap up and certainly appreciate you guys listening in and uh, be happy to take any questions. Hey, John, hey, thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah. Mute my, uh, my other system over there. Um, yeah, there, it's, you know, as you said early in your pre uh, presentation, there's more security in the hands of developers now, uh, you know, and, and making it easier for them with tools like this where security is being embedded early uh, and throughout the development life cycle. So it's great to see some of that, uh, that work. As, as I said, you know, it seems like everybody that's presented on here is using Nexus and Twistlock together within their environments. It seems like kind of a you know, standard pattern to see with uh, within environments. So um, we will uh, we will catch you in the Slack channel for Q and A. Um, and uh, if you could, when you go in there, uh, share your slides so that uh, anyone that wants to get a hold of them uh, can uh, can do that as well. Absolutely. I'd be happy to Thanks for having us. I really appreciate it. Enjoy talking with everybody today. Yeah, thanks again, John. Really appreciate it.